وأصلي وأسلم على سير الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for another opportunity to uh, ponder you know, on the position of Muslims in the world and also to um, reflect on how we can uh, improve ourselves uh, as believers, uh, families, and as an ummah. And this topic uh, of Islam at the crossroads uh, really, I believe, is one of the cutting edge topics. It's a very important subject. And <clears throat> it touches not only the Ummah as a whole, but also communities, families, and above all, individuals. And that is um, so important to us uh, because of the present situation that we are in today. And before we go into the meat of the course itself, um, we want to have an orientation. And this is really uh, to give us the context and we have to again reflect upon our context uh, as Muslims in the world to try to analyze it, to understand it, and then to seek uh, solid solutions from where we are. And um, today in the world, uh, to a great extent in many parts of the world, Muslims are literally calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in a type of desperation. And this is something which has happened um, in Islamic history at different points. And uh, it is part of Sunnatullah. It is part of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for the world. In the same way that with the healing of a wound, um, the person is inflicted with the wound, but the healing process uh, is a painful one. And that pain reminds the person uh, of the wound itself. And so the pain that we are going through as a nation, turn, turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I believe, based upon um, what has happened in the past, that as the pain intensifies and as we um, respond properly to the pain, then um, there are openings. There are openings that happen, and it is not something new. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, revealed and has willed this uh, in his glorious book. Now Allah tells us in Surah Al-Talaq, verse 3, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِي these are very important um, verses here, especially when people start to feel uh, they are surrounded. They start to feel um, that there's no way out. Allah tells us, and whoever keeps his duty to Allah, whoever has taqwa, whoever has the consciousness of Allah, then Allah would make a mahraj a way out. There will be a way out from the circumstance. And Allah will provide for that person from a place that he, he didn't even know. And whoever depends on Allah, whoever depends on Allah, then Allah will be sufficient for him. Surely Allah will reach his purpose and he has made a limit for all things. So this uh, section of this verse, right in the beginning of Surah Al-Talaq, uh, actually um, is a complete answer in itself and, and, and shows us, and this is really the most important part of the whole course that we are about to go through, inshallah, and that is taqwa Allah and tawakkal Allah. That is the consciousness of Allah, right? That uh, recognition within ourself of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming, drawing close to the Creator. And that interprets into tawakkul, dependence. So it's not just believing that there is a God somewhere, because there are even agnostics, people who um, believe that there's a God, but God has no real impact in the world. 
The second part is what uh, uh, gives the full definition, and that is not only are we aware of Allah, but we depend on the Creator. And so that dependence, the more that dependence is there, then Allah is sufficient for the believer, no matter what the circumstance is. And the Qur'an itself gives us many examples of this. The stories of the Anbiya gives us many examples of uh, people being pushed to their limit, their complete limit. At that point, they depend on Allah. And that really is where we are going right now as an ummah. And this is something that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu predicted because he did not speak from himself. His knowledge came from above seven heavens. And many times he would, um, he would say things, information that came to him, not realizing that one day uh, people would be able to even understand what he said even better than the people that were around him. Okay, which might sound strange because he is the source. But as we go to the day of judgment, there are certain signs that even become more and more clear. And from these signs, the Prophet ﷺ said, he told us, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تظهر الفتن ويكتر الكذب وتتقارب الأسواق. So the Prophet ﷺ said on the authority of Abu Huraira, uh, he said an authentic hadith, the last hour would not come about until trials and temptations appear. Fitan, which is the plural of fitna. Lying would be on the increase. And the marketplaces would come close. Okay, so these are three points that he made as we're going toward the Day of Judgment. And I believe that we uh, are able to understand this in a way that other people in previous generations were not able to understand. Because the fitna coming through handheld devices, coming through this new technology, is something like no other generation has ever experienced before. The temptations that come to the individuals, and even now to children, who to a great extent were um, sheltered from many of the uh, temptations that the adults were pushed into, that the children themselves having access to the internet uh, are actually under a tremendous temptation. And so these, the whore will fit in. The, it will come, it will appear, it will be all over the place. And now we see people all over the world and it never <clears throat> ceases to amaze me when I travel, especially in large cities. Not so much in rural areas, but in large cities, when you come to a stop and you look at the people, many of them, if not all of them, are like this. They're looking at their device. Everywhere. This is all over the world, and it's not just so-called industrialized countries, because people use cell phones uh, better and more in Africa and in India than they do here, actually. Their level of cell phone use is even stronger than us. Uh, and so this is the first part. The second, lying. The increase of lying. And politic politicians who have always uh, used trickery uh, in their poly tricks uh, have now reached another stage. And south of the border, um, we are experiencing, you know, on a national level in that country, um, people are in a state of confusion because there is so many lies that are coming from the highest level in government, people are confused about which direction to actually go. And so it is increased. And again, this is where uh, we understand it more because with mass communications, it is increased. The ability of the, li of the lie has actually increased. <clears throat> The third one is very interesting as well, and here it is saying uh, that the marketplace would come close. Tataqarab al-aswaq. So aswaq is the plural of souq, right? The marketplace. And many of the muhaddithin may have looked at this uh, hadith and thought that yes, um, marketplaces tended to be 
in the time of the Prophet Sallam outside the city, like on the outskirts of the city. Right? And then it's, they start to move in. And people open up shops um, by their house. And certain things, instead of everybody going outside or, or to a specific area, it now starts to move. But we, again, have reached another level. Amazon. Amazon jungle, right, that our minds are all caught up in. Amazon has taken this to another stage. And the Chinese are moving goods around with their own names other than Amazon. They are moving things around to the point where you can be in your bed. And you go on the international marketplace, do your business, and go back to sleep. You haven't even left your bed. So Sadaqa Rasulullah, alayhi salatu wasalam, the marketplace would come close. Now it's right inside of our bedrooms. You don't even have to go outside to be in the marketplace. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, was given a type of knowledge that um, we need to respect and to reflect uh, upon, especially in the present circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I want to, um, I want to reflect with you um, on an issue which really has um, troubled me and, in a sense, stimulated me from being a student of history, because people tend, when they look at history, this is how uh, historians um, trick a lot of people. They take you way back in history. They take you to a point where it's irrelevant to you now. But the history of the last 50 years or 100 years, very few people know about. How many people actually know about the Korean conflict, the Korean War, and how serious the Korean War was? Okay, and, and even now, when you go back a little bit, you'll see that the average uh, uh, person, especially young people, they, they have no clue as to what happened. But take them back to the Greeks and the Romans, and they can tell you something now. It might not be the actual truth. It's sort of a fantasy type of Greek and Roman society. But they have an idea. And this idea goes back to 1945. In 1945, the uh, Allied forces, um, British, American, European, whatever, fighting the Axis powers of Italy, uh, Germany, and Japan, they reached a point of frustration. And around 1945, the Americans especially wanted to end the war. Now, they were getting uh, signals from the Japanese government that the Japanese were just about ready to surrender. But they wanted to make a conclusion to this war that would not only stop the conflict, but it would also give them a predominant position in the world. In other words, you want to make a statement. If you want to be the superpower in the world, you have to do something or you have to have something that people will recognize you as the superpower. The British used to say that the sun never set on the British Empire. It never set. Any part of the world, there was something that they owned. Okay? So the Americans dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. This is a nuclear weapon. And this is a picture of Hiroshima uh, after the, this initial destruction. And you can see how destroyed this major city was. Over 100,000 people, say 130,000 they say, they died instantly. Instantly they were dead. And uh, the Japanese society, uh, at that point, they were on their knees. And they, they then, but to make it worse, they went to another city, Nagasaki, and they dropped another one. So they were making a statement to the world that we are here. It is no longer the British or the French. We are the ones. It's not the Russians. We have the Russian scientists. 
We have the German scientists, right? We're on top. So they made their statement. But what is important to me as a student of history, and this is important for us to reflect upon when we think about ourselves, is that by 1969, now count those years, that's only 24 years. Think of your own life, right? 24 years, count back. In 24 years, the Japanese had bounced back to become a world economic power. In 24 years. After a horrendous Holocaust experience, they came back. What is it that the Japanese people had? Something about their character. They're very humble uh, people. Something about their leadership. They say that even in the recent uh, nuclear fallout in Fukushima, that when they were cleaning up certain areas uh, and the people had to go to the stores, they even have to measure the nuclear waste, uh, whether it's so much in the food. And people are lined up. And then when they realize there's a long people in the line, the ones in the front put food back for the other ones. Think about this. Think what would happen in America or Canada, right? Especially America. If they, if they said it's a blackout now, you're not going to have any food, they would be fighting each other for food. And they would go in the store and buy, you know, a hundred cans of tuna fish. Not two. They buy a hundred. Okay, but the Japanese, there's something in their culture. And, and there is a culture of cooperation with each other, uh, humility, and self-sacrifice. Okay, and they respect their leadership. 24 years. The Germans, this is Berlin in 1945. They bombed Berlin into the Stone Age. And this huge metropolis was wasted. Think about pictures of Syria, right? This was wasted in 1945. They killed the leadership, destroyed the army, took over the country. But again, by 1969, that's Berlin. 24 years. Look at this. In 24 years, they had bounced back to be a world economic power. What do the Germans have? What is it about them? To show you what human beings are capable of doing. And this is important for us to be able to reflect upon when we look at some of the destruction happening in our ummah. And sometimes we think people, we can never come back from this. But no, that's not the kind of thinking that the Japanese had uh, or the Germans uh, had during this Holocaust. So when we look at the Muslim world and the potential of the Muslim world, and this is something to reflect upon, and I reflect upon this constantly. You can do it in many different ways. But if you really look at our nation from a lot of different angles, and you know, we can, you know, I'll go just briefly into this because we know there's a number of students who may be coming next week, and we'll do a slight review uh, for you know, the rest as we go on further. But some of the richest people on earth actually live in our countries. Okay, and we have a lot of actual wealth. There's a lot of material wealth uh, within our nation. Also, we have a history of power and respect. We have some of the great empires of the world, uh, and we had the respect uh, of the planet for many centuries. You could even say that we were the basis of the Renaissance period that the Europeans after the so-called Dark Ages, from around, say, 500 to 1500, when they start coming back, they say the rebirth, right, the Renaissance. We were the ones, because during that period was the golden age of Islam. So we were the ones that actually provided the impetus uh, for the Renaissance, okay? Also, we can still say that Islam is the fastest growing religion on earth. With all the calamities that are striking us, 
people are still embracing Islam. And it's amazing how this can actually come about. I was part of a group um, last week. We went to Nassau in the Bahamas uh, with Husna.com, uh, excellent group, and uh, over 850 uh, Muslims. And we were in a resort. We took over the whole hotel, established prayer, Islamic activities, halal food and whatever. And, you know, it's, it's, it's shocking to people, but I, I, I've seen this before, that, you know, because of good relationships that many of the Muslims had with the staff, and we especially encouraged the Muslims, be on your best, you know, and they were on their best. And by the third day or so, one of the staff, he had a tobe on and he had taken shahada and he had embraced Islam. And there were other members of the staff, they're accepting Islam, I mean, what way of life is, is like this, man? Think about this, where a person's literally going to embrace Islam. And, and right near the end, we went on a historical tour. We ended at the local masjid, and the brother came with us. And it turned out he lives down the street from the masjid, right? And he, you know, we, 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 we handed him to the masjid. They took care of him, you know, immediately. And there are others waiting to embrace Islam. And we did not debate anybody. We did not um, pass out flyers. We just acted like Muslims. Okay, and the impact that Islam can have on other individuals, it's still uh, the fastest growing. To the point where we're over 26% of the world's population. They're always underestimating us in terms of the international census, right? But we are, you know, still a huge uh, sector within um, the, the world and everything that we do, we, we end up, you know, way up there. Even tourism, something like tourism, because we have people doing really good and some people doing really terrible, right? But Muslims want to, they want to get out. They want to move around. So halal tourism is now one of the biggest sectors in the whole tourism, tourism industry uh, in the world right now. It's Muslims wanting to travel and have halal things and, and to learn something, you know, about their faith. Why do you wear a hijab and stuff? So I said, look, Allah, it's like a diamond. You cannot sell diamond on the street. And it's like a Muslim woman is someone that no man can approach just like that to her. So I explained some of the things. And she said, like, like she's an atheist. She was from a Catholic mm -hmm. background. Right. She's an atheist. She said, I do not find any peace. But I have been looking, like, I, she, she's been asking all the Muslims. She was knowing about Islam. Finally, she talked to me. She said, I think the real peace is in Islam. Is there a way to become a Muslim? Mm -hmm. I said, oh my God, I'm not going to leave this chance. I, I told to her to come. Like, I give address to... I, I never know about the guidelines of being Muslim. Yeah. So I told her like to come in IIT and consult one of our sheikh. I said, she said, I'm really going to do that. Like, hopefully Inshallah. So this is an experience. This is a phenomenon that is going on. So it's not about numbers. It's not about potential, right? It's not about natural resources. We have natural resources. Our countries are in strategic positions. And if you look at the positions that our countries are, are on, it's strategic. The international trade routes, Red Sea, you know, uh, Indian Ocean, East Africa. You'll see all over the world the Silk Route. You'll see the key strategic positions um, that our countries are in. Also, we have huge standing armies. So there's no reason, no logical reason why we should be um, getting defeated like this. Okay? So this is, this is amazing potential. Right? And a sh another shocking point is we have a lot of youth. And I experienced this not only in the Muslim world, but actually in Europe itself. And I remember being in uh, Scandinavia. And in Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, the Muslim youth 
conferences that they have, it's something, you know, it's shocking to the Scandinavians. And especially since the Muslims are now speaking their language and they're raised there, okay? And, you know, our numbers in terms of youth, look at the University of Toronto and you will see that, you know, in terms of MSA, the MSA there, the size, the amount of people who want to make Juma is like no other organization on campus, no other student organization of a religion or a group or anything. So we're a nation of the future. Okay, so that's potential. And again, this is our context now. You gotta keep, we have to keep in our mind. At the same time, um, we have intellectuals, we have educational resources, right? All of this is there, everything is in place. Okay, but what is happening? Along with the wealth, there is poverty. Some of the poorest countries in the world are Muslim countries. So poverty is there. Although there is some of the richest people, there's great potential. But some of the poorest countries are actually Muslim majorities. So that's like a contradiction, right? It's a contradiction. So you got wealth and you got poverty. Okay. Also, we have large numbers, we have armies, we have strategic position, but we are feeling defeat. We are feeling defeat now, okay, on the ground. And this is le leading to frustration. So that frustration is there on different levels, whether it be on personal level, family level, community level, national level, ummah, you know, level. There's a type of frustration because you have the potential, but yet you're not performing. If you don't have the potential and you don't perform, then you realize you're just not up to it. But when you have the potential and don't produce, that can create frustration. Okay? And um, another issue, which you'll see on all kinds of levels, is this argumentation and debate, where people... Um, start to debate and you know with the internet now that's maybe part of the fitna of the internet that you know we have you know the Sheikh Google and Wikipedia and all this so now we have muftis on every corner you know and the Prophet said in authentic hadith ma dalla qawmun qat ba'da huda illa utul jadl that people would not go astray after guidance after guidance until they were given the ability to argue. Jadal, that means to argue and fight and contradict each other. Okay, so this, these things are honest. This is the issue. That's the context. Okay, amazing potential, you know, but not getting results. You know, something happening here and actually going in the opposite direction. So in this type of situation, um, people are crying for change. That is a common factor. We are making dua, you know, to change our own life, you know, our family situation, our community. We're making dua, you know, for our nations. You know, some want Islamic um, politics. They want Islamic state. Some want Islamic economy. So they want halal bank. So their whole life is on banking. Some want halal social life. Some brothers and sisters have, have dedicated their life to halal tourism. They're crying for, to Allah to help them, you know, change the social conditions. In some parts of the world, strangely enough, some Muslims are praying to Allah just to have halal food. And that sounds strange to us because we have so many options of eating halal. But right in our own city, and we were reflecting at one point the days of the Jami Mosque, you know, back in 1970, uh, and Brother Abdul Qadir from Pakistan, Rahimullah, uh, opened up a meat store on the corner of Bausted, right? That was one of the first halal shops in the city. And everybody from all over would go to Abdul Qadir's shop. Uh, to get their meat from the east end and from the north, everything. 
He would go down there because he would go out into the country, sacrifice the animals, prepare them. And he had nowhere else you could get it. You got to eat kosher, or you got to eat fish, or you get another fatwa of the people of the book. Right? But, but people who believe in eating the halal, straight up, strictly halal. So some people in some parts of the world still at this. What is common is the cry for change. And this is the oft-repeated verse in Surah Al-Rad, verse 11, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma biqawmin, hatta yughayiru ma bianfusihim. Surely Allah will not change the condition of a people till they change that which is in themselves. So the real change is within us. And this is the context of our understanding of uh, revival, of change. Because the question really is, um, how can we bring about the change? I use the West. Okay, because the East, in a sense, the Muslim world, you know, may Allah help them, you know, that's beyond us. Um, we want change in the Muslim world as well, but at least we can think about change here. Because we have a certain, we have sort of a, you know, a microcosm of what's happening in the Muslim world, right? Because we have a lot of people, a lot of masjids, you know, whatever, but yet we're getting hit with all these propaganda articles, this fifth estate coming out and attacking Muslims and, you know, on the television, the radio, everybody taking hits at us uh, now, right? So it's a microcosm, okay? So a change has got to come about where our uh, potential, the potential right here in the GTA, right, over 20% or more in the GTA is Muslims, our economic potential is unbelievable. Right? Once if, if it came together, right? So all of this is what we're talking about, this major change uh, to try to bring about. Okay? So the question is that we want to um, begin to look at uh, is in terms of bringing about change. And within our um, nation, there are people who are struggling for different types of change. Okay? And, and this really we want to look at uh, in terms of going into this particular topic of change. So um, reform or revival. Now some of these words are sort of interchangeable uh, in some cases, but you know, basically, basically, in the Webster Dictionary, when they are talking about reform, they are talking about to put or change into an improved form or condition, right? You reform it, okay? To amend or improve by change, by change of form or removal of faults or abuses. So in order to um, amend it, you change the form of it, okay? So you literally change its form. The other, other part of definition is a number of them. To put an end to, and they say an evil, Right, but that's evil is in the eyes of the beholder. To put an end to an evil by enforcing or introducing a better method of or course of action. So there was there was an, a course of action that people were involved in. Okay, and the reform is going to say no, we don't want your method. Okay, it's going to be a better method of doing it. Right, a new course of action. So this is a reform. Okay, and also to induce or cause uh, to abandon evil ways. If they say he's a reformed person, he went to, they even say they'll put youth in reform school, as they used to call it, reform school. Reform school is like the prison for youth, okay, because they want to reform them. So that's part of the concept of reform. But in the definitions of reform, when it comes to a way of life, right, a civilization, the right there you see where you literally change course or you change the form of it. So you will have, uh, in, like for instance, Jewish people that used to be basically one way, either you're practicing Judaism or you're not practicing it. Now, because of movements against them, 
you have Orthodox Jews and you have Reformed Jews. And some of them, they even use the name. So the Orthodox Jew would be the person who follows closer to the Torah. The men have locks. Uh, the women cover their hair in, in one way. They eat strictly kosher food. You know, on Saturday, it's the Sabbath. You know, no business, no nothing. They follow, you know, they try to follow the Torah. And the Reformed Jew uh, identifies with Judaism, but some Reformed Jews eat pork. They'll have a ham sandwich or bacon and eggs, right? Now imagine that, right? You're supposed to be Jewish and you're having a ham sandwich. Some of them actually actually don't believe in God. Right, and, and some of the Reforms even don't believe in God. Right, and, and they say that even some of the founders of the state of Israel, uh, Ben Gurion and some of the early people, yeah, they, they doubted the, the Creator. You know, and, and that was a reform that came in. And it, it's really a shaitanic type of thing. And uh, it is only amongst their orthodox that you have people, you have different types, but there are some who are battling to try to bring back the original message. Okay, so they have literally given it a name. Okay, so now, what about Muslims? Are you going to have orthodox Muslim and reform Muslim? Okay? Many or many in between. So this is the issue now. There are people who are struggling for the reform. They're struggling for it. And, and, and they want to introduce new ways of functioning. They even have women's masjid in the United States. Progressive. Right. They use the word, I mean, all these words are being uh, messed up. You know, now it's so-called progressive. Uh, Muslim like this. And um, things like this are happening. So this is one form of change. Okay? Another form of change uh, would be uh, revival or renewal. Some even say, they call, it, they call it revitalization. That's kind of a big word. To revitalize. To renew. To revive. Okay, this is tajdeed. Um, and the Prophet ﷺ told us um, in authentic hadith that inna Allaha yab'ath li hadhihi al-umma ala ra'si kulli mi'at sana man yujaddid lahum laha dina. That the Prophet, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, verily Allah will raise up for this ummah at the head of every century someone who will rejuvenate for them their religion. And in another tradition, ala ra'si kulli qarnin mujaddid. There's different traditions like this. But in this one tradition that we used here in, in Mishkat al-Masabi, it, it has been authenticated, um, you know, it says ala ra'si kulli miyat sena. So use the word miya, a hundred. Okay? And when it's used, the scholars understood that when 100 is used, it's not necessarily specifically exactly 100. But it is generally a century. And some, in looking at Qarun too, said it could be a generation. So it could be at the head of the generation. There would be somebody who would rejuvenate the religion. Yujaddid. So from Yujaddid comes Tajdeed. Tajdeed. Okay, so these are the terminologies. We know the word, those who study in Arabic, jadid, right? Hadha kitabun jadid. This is a new book, right? Jadid, jadada, yujadidu, to make new. That's another form of the verb. So the musta, tajdid. Okay, so this, these are the traditions, authenticated. And um, so tajdeed, literally, uh, it is renewal, or you could say restored to how it was prior to the change. OK? You restore it to how it was before the change. OK? And 
Another way to say it is ihya. So some of the scholars use ihya, which is another way to say it. Um, it's like reviving, restoring the status quo without necessarily any attempt to improve or reform. So that's literally, uh, these are literal definitions of the terms. Okay? So this is tajdeed. But now, in terms of the religious definition, and I will be going over this again next week, inshallah, you know, when more of the students come. In terms of, I want to give you some scholarly definitions. Okay? So we want to look at a scholar from different time periods. If you look at the scholars in the first 200 years uh, after the Hijrah, right? So you get the early scholar, and then you get somebody after a thousand years, and then we will get a contemporary scholar. Okay, so you'll see some different definitions. And Ibn Shihab al Zuhri, Rahimahullah, who died 124 after the Hijrah, that's about 724 of the Common Era, meaning AD, right? CE. So he said that revival, what is tajdeed? So he said tajdeed is revival. So he's using the word ihya. It, revival of that which has disappeared or died uh, due to neglect of the Quran and the Sunnah and their requirements. Okay? So, you know, not following Quran and Sunnah, you neglected it, you didn't deal with it, and then it died out. So you're reviving it again. This is how he looked at it, right? That's from the early, you know, scholars. Uh, Az-Zuhri was very, very famous uh, amongst the great uh, scholars of Islam. Now you get a, a middle uh, person, after a while, this is Jalal al-Din Suyuti, Rahimahullah, who died 911 years after the Hijrah, 1505. He said, Tajdeed in religion means renewal of its guidance, explanation of its truth, as well as eradication of evil innovation, bid'ah. Right? And eradication of extremism. Right? Meaning al ghulu or laxity in religion. So to, to, to make the renewal, right, you're bringing back the guidance uh, of Islam, right? You're explaining the truth and you're getting, getting rid of things. You're getting rid of the, the, the bid'ah that has come in, the innovations. So you get rid of the innovations, right? And then you also get rid of extremism. Now look how this applies to us, because you've got to be balanced, right? Or laxity in religion, and that's the problem of some of the reformists. They're lazy Muslims. So some are extremist Muslims, and some are lazy Muslims. So he's saying you've got to eradicate them, okay? And you've got to get rid of the bid'ah that is there, and explain the truth. Bring the guidance of Islam. And another point is, of course, these are long definitions that they have, but from their definitions, he also said, he's, he's a very prolific scholar. And he also said, tajdeed also means observance of people's benefits. This is maslaha. You have to observe the benefit of the people, societal traditions, and the norms of civilization, and sharia. So this is like a, this is a mujtahid. Many people consider him to be one of the mujaddids, the renewal of the faith in his time. But you see what he's saying? He's saying that in making this, in bringing, in restoring the deen, you have to take into consideration what's going to benefit the people. Okay? So if we are in, in, in this time, you know, you're not, you're not going to say, I'm going to restore the deen, everybody get your camel, and get your, your horse, come out of your Toyota. Okay? We're in the middle of the, of the winter. You want to be Sunnah? Get on the camel. Right? That's insanity. Right? So you have to think of the benefit of the people, what is going on. You have to recognize what's happening in the society as well. 
Okay, this is this is this is part of it, right? No. Extremism would be um, like the you know the, the concept of the Khawarij, the people who went outside of the religion completely. They refuse to accept the leadership, and they go to extremes. We have extremists now in the Muslim world who because they lost their sanity and they're blowing things up, right? all over the place, right, in the name of Islam, right? That's extremism, because you're not supposed to be killing innocent people, right? But that, that would be a form of extremism, right? So that has to be uh, dealt with, okay, in order to. And, you know, he, he's, this is a deep definition here. And this is a type of, um, because what comes out of the tajdeed, one of the tools of the tajdeed is what they call, it's, ijti, <coughs> it's ijtihad. And the ijtihad is making the religious decisions based upon the society, your sources, and the society, and the environment. Right? So an ijtihad, which is a major religious decision, has to take into account the norms of the civilization now. It takes it into account, but its basis is sharia. It does not go outside the parameters of sharia. But it takes into account what is happening with the people at the time period. And that is a reality that we have to face because the li lifestyle that we're living now is very much different than the lifestyle of people who lived 1400 years ago. Okay? So in many cases, you've got to have the spirit of the law and you have the principles of the law and you apply it in the new circumstance. So this is the tajdeed. And we're going to Look at this again, inshallah, uh, next week when maybe hopefully others will be there. Okay? Now, uh, a contemporary scholar, Dr. Yusuf al Qaradawi, um, who has written on this from a contemporary point of view, and um, you know, has a good way with words and a good understanding. Um, from amongst his writings, and there's a lot of writings, he has some very nice. Simple statements that make a lot of sense. So he said, combining the beneficial old with the appropriate new. Al Qadim al Nafiya, wal Jadid al Salih. So you combine the beneficial old, right, with the appropriate new. See what he said? So you're taking your principles, you know, from what was there. And you apply it to what is appropriate today, not for things that's not appropriate. Because your principles are there. You can't leave your principles. OK? So that, 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 that's a nice short thing. And then he said, being open to the outside world without melting into it. That's a nice one. So you're open to the, to the outside world, but you don't melt into it. I used to liken this to when we used to make soup, right? So we're making our soup and you throw everything inside of the soup. You know, and, and, and if you cook it uh, for a while, you can still have soup where you taste the carrot and you have a piece of meat and you have all your different elements of the soup. But if you let it cook too long, it becomes broth, where everything is melted down. And that literally can happen to us as well in this society. And we have, can see in Canada and in America, generations who came 100 years ago, and many of them melted down into the society. They completely melted. And if you go back in their generations, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, my great-great-grandfather was a Muslim. You can, you can find people like this. But they're totally melted down into the society. So he's saying, no, be open to the outside world. Deal with it. But don't melt into it. Keep your identity, right? We're here in Canada now, functionally, we're Muslims, but it doesn't mean that you have to be a good Canadian, go to the Montreal, you know, to the Maple Leafs and drink beer. Because you've got to drink beer when you're watching hockey. No, you, don't have, you can have chai and watch the hockey game, man, if that's what you drink. You can have a soft drink, right? You can have nice mango, and you can watch the hockey game. You don't have to drink a beer. You see? 
So, so you, you were involved in the society. You wanted the maple leaves to win, and you cheered for them, but you drank your mango punch. Okay? Then he said also, very interesting, to rejuvenate the religion by the religion itself. So you rejuvenate the dean by the dean. So you use your principles from the religion and you rejuvenate it. And you know what the biggest, one of the biggest problems is? The average people have not studied the religion. So they think that the religion is only a few narrow things that they were taught by their family or they saw in their village, not realizing the religion is broad. Right? So the more you study the religion and the more you study different ulama and scholars and how they applied it, then you can see the broad-based religion and you can you know, now understand better how we can be Muslim in this particular time period. So these are, these are some scholars, these are three uh, scholars and they are giving definitions of tajdeed. Okay? And this is what we are looking for. Tajdeed or ihya. And we will be looking at this um, in different ways. The base of the course uh, will be coming from a text that I put together. And this is the 40 Ahadith on Islamic Revival. And uh, this came about, and I'll be honest with you how it came about, it was originally a, a, a selfish thing because I was uh, giving a lot of talks and I was, you know, keeping my, I was recording them. We didn't have uh, laptops and, you know, flash drives and, you know, so we had cards and we had notebooks and stuff. So I'm recording them, right? And suddenly I have a lot of all these piles of things, right? And now they're asking speakers to travel. And I don't have a photographic memory like a Suyuti or any of the great scholars. And I can't walk into a place carrying my books. So I decided what I would do <coughs> is uh, go through all of the khutbas. <coughs> so I went through all of the uh, talks that I did, or most of them, to try to see what I was actually saying. Because you know what I found out? And you know, with all respects to our community, but this is the reality. I might have given a talk uh, 10 years ago, because if you've been around for a while, you've given the talk. So I gave a talk 10 years ago, and then bring it out, and then you know, update it a little bit. And the people, let's say, mashallah, like this is revelation. But it's something that I said 10 years ago, right? Because many of the problems are repeating themselves. Okay? And in different parts of the world, what I found out is that the problems Muslims were facing is similar all over the place. So I went through these uh, talks <clears throat> and I found about 40 plus hadiths. And these hadiths were repeating themselves over and over and over again. So I put them together. Again, it's selfish in a sense. But I know that if I have these 40 plus 50 hadiths, and, I'm, and I have these with me, and I memorize them or I know them, that wherever I go, one of them is going to be, uh, it's going to come. And sure enough, I'll go around the world, travel, listen to other khutbas. I love to listen to other imams. And in 80% of the times, they're going to quote one of these 40 hadiths. It's going to come. Okay? And I sat with some scholars, um, graduates of Al Azhar University in Cape Town. And I sat with the scholars and we looked at this, and I realized that these hadith, there is a, there's a method to it, it's a methodology. There's actually something happening here, right? And we studied it and looked at it, and we realized that it is revival. Every single part of the Muslim world right now is in need of a revival, of tajdeed. It's not the same form, but it is, a, it is a renewal and a revival that the people have become stagnated in one way or another and under attack 
and need to have that original spirit and lifestyle of Islam to be brought up in a relevant way today. And so we put it together using the system of Imam al-Nawawi, Rahimullah, the famous 40 hadiths. So we put it together uh, and made it into a 40 hadith. Okay, so this is a metan. The metan is um, the basic uh, Arabic texts. So there is a metan here of the 40 hadith, and uh, I did a little bit of an explanation uh, of it. And what I have found, and Allah knows best over the years, especially in the West, that you know, the areas that, that, that have come up in this, it's not the traditional areas. Okay? And I'll give you just a, an idea of some of the areas um, that we want to be looking at you know, as part of the tajdeed. Um, you know, uh, what is most in, the importance of the heart, destruction and salvation, real strength, decency and vulgarity, um, the two-faced one, balance in religion, the strong believer, the legacy of truth and tolerance, uh, ease in Allah's religion, true brotherhood on dealing with elders and children, modesty and begging, the danger of oppression, the curse of favoritism, the importance of trust, amana, right? The right to self-defense, the right of the road, the power of peer pressure. Now, where are you going to get someone talking about peer pressure? You know what I mean, right? The pressure that's on teenagers to wear certain clothes and act certain ways. What's our Islamic position? Danger of the material world, enhancing the environment, the prohibitions of all intoxications. So there's one whole section on intoxication. That means marijuana. What's our position? Okay, the answer, we have a hadith on this, a central hadith. Treatment of women. Uh, seven major sins. Repelling superstitions, right? Sweetness of faith, the danger of extremism, right? The callers to hell, a divine look at the future. So what this is as a package is not the only um, package, but it is, a, it is a form, right, that we can follow uh, in order to uh, look at relevant issues facing our community in this. And what this methodology does, it actually helps you to, um, how do you bring about a revival in yourself? How can you bring about a revival in your family? How can you understand what is this concept of revival? This is a methodology. It's a menhaj. So it's a menhaj for this change, uh, inshallah, that we will go about. And at the end of the course, inshallah, I picked out uh, three people who are considered to be, by many, uh, some of the great mujaddids of this uh, deen. Okay? And in different parts of the Muslim world. And one is Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, who is from Baghdad. So that would be from Iraq you know, area. Uh, another is Shawali Allah, Dahlawi, who comes from the Indo-Pakistani subcontinent. And the other is, is Sheikh Uthman Danfodio of Sokoto in West Africa. And he is a great scholar, mujaddid. And I actually did my PhD thesis in the University of Toronto on Sheikh Uthman Danfodio. So um, these three have practical applications of Islam in their times. right? And they give you a menhaj or a program of change. So we want to look at their life and also look at some of the key points of change that they actually uh, brought out uh, and see how this can apply um, you know, to ourselves. And for those of you, because many of us have um, uh, read from Imam al-Ghazali, many have, re have read, uh, some have had the, the, the understanding of uh, Shawali Allah, as, but very few know Sheikh Sheik Uthman than for you. And I can say to you, 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 you will get, you will be surprised at the level of this scholar and what he actually did with his teachings. That's the difference. We're going to end with him. Because he, he not only um, re revived the faith in the community amongst the scholars and amongst the people, but when he was attacked by the evil kings, he made hijrah, he did a migration, and they had a battle of Badr where they were 
and they defeated the evil kings. And then he sent his scholars from different parts of what they call Hausa land. You know, it's by the Sahara Desert, northern Nigeria. It's a huge area. And they opened up 250,000 square kilometers. This is 100 years before the coming of the British. And they governed with Sharia. 250,000 square kilometers. Islamic law all over the place. And he actually started a woman's movement. This is a, this, he is an amazing scholar. He started a woman's movement, which is going up until now in northern Nigeria. Okay, so we will look at his writings along with the other uh, great scholars, uh, inshallah, as a practical means of understanding tajdi. So I want to open up the floor for any questions uh, uh, that anybody has uh, concerning you know, the revival uh, and what we are going into. No, it doesn't mean, I mean, you might think that provision might mean you, you, you have this taqwa and suddenly there's food. It's going to pop up. No. Some people like say that this, this verse is for like risk. Right? Risk. You know, the mahraj, some people's mahraj is to leave this world. Because if we believe in the hereafter, death is a transition. And if a person dies as a shaheed, right, they're actually transitioning into a higher form of life. So we don't know how this makharaj is going to be, right, or when it will come. People think, I'm going to make dua, and I'm going to wait. OK, Allah, uh, hurry up, please. It doesn't happen like that. It does not happen like this, right? So the makharaj, it comes at the appointed time. And when a person is in dependence on Allah, then Allah is sufficient. They, they, they can deal with um, the qadr, the will of Allah as it comes, and Allah is sufficient for them. So the makhraj is many different things it could be to get, you, get, to get out of a situation. It's not one particular uh, form. Now, any other general questions that anybody has? The floor is open. So inshallah, I will also bring next week um, copies of the text, the metan. Um, you know, I've had some made up and, you know, for a reduced price so everybody will get it. You know, we'll, we'll have copies so you, you can have this metan yourself, you know, and be able to um, and, and go along and we'll be dealing with the different areas and then ending up uh, with the scholars, inshallah. Okay? So, inshallah, we'll see you next week. Have a safe journey home. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.